My name is Gabi. Hello, everyone. Uh, up first will be Victoria O'Mara, who is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at Western University. Her research, in her research, she seeks to clarify and critique the unique labor dynamics that characterize the relationship between social media platforms and social media influencers. So I do apologize for my reliance on notes to begin, um, but I mean, my thinking is a little bit all over the place on this at this point, so um, it's going to help me kind of clarify and hopefully make it all uh, come together seamlessly for you guys. So uh, my talk is called Weapons of the Chic, Instagram Influencer Comment Pods as Cooperative Algorithm Hacking. Um, and it's based on part of my dissertation research. It's sort of an effort to think through some of the disruptive or maybe deviant um, um, practices that Instagram influencers have kind of begun to engage in in the past few years. And it's a type of what I'm calling kind of algorithmic subterfuge. It's designed to exploit the logics of Instagram's platform infrastructure. And so today, I want to essentially sort of raise two points. Um, the first is to kind of think through this comment pod as a unique and contemporary instance of sort of labor organizing um, that responds to a change in the conditions of influencers' work. Um, and so I want to first kind of make the case that preference-driven algorithms that curate our social media news feeds are not just about creating these sort of seductive environments for um, users or consumers, um, but they also function as a sort of disciplinary apparatus and a mechanism of labor control um, for the influencers who operate on those platforms. So by way of doing that, um, I'm going to then shift gears into talking about comment pods and as a form of sort of tech-directed labor organizing. Um, and as I kind of go through this, if anybody sort of feels or sees a parallel between this and some sort of historic instance of labor organizing, um, tweet me, talk to me. I would love to hear about it. Um, that would be great. Okay, so the second thing I want to do is uh, try and think through on kind of a broader scale the implications of these practices of comment pods uh, for discussions about algorithmic identity, uh, data doubles, or the digital self, um, and the inevitable limits of our efforts to metrify, um, to capture and quantify and valorize human expression and sociality. Um, you know, at a time when we're sort of grappling with the meaning and the ramifications of events like Cambridge Analytica uh, and the way that data has kind of intensified the ability to uh, target and influence, I think practices such as these uh, that, you know, that subvert by communities of users um, seem all the more relevant and important to add to those conversations. This is a lot of the time when we talk about, you know, a data trail or your digital footprint, I think some of that discourse encourages a view of the online self as something that we emit or excrete um, as a byproduct of sort of our online lives to be scooped up by corporations. Um, but that framing also sort of obscures the way that that trail is something that people more and more uh, create actively. Um, they produce with knowledge of platform algorithms and of how they work. So in that way, um, what is produced is never perfect nor complete representation of who we are. Um, and I think that space of ambiguity is an interesting kind of site of analysis and uh, potential for creativity and uh, potential resistance. So. Okay. A little bit of background, just some boring stuff. Instagram's an image-based social networking site. Uh, it's currently boasting about 800 million users. It is, um, as I'm sure everybody knows, owned by Facebook. It's proven to be a particularly attractive host for advertisers, um, according to Media Kicks, as you'll see here. Ooh, I can use this thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth about $1.6 billion uh, as of this year. Um, so given its commercial saturation, it might not be the first place we think to look about web practices that go against the grain. Um, but influencers have been engaged in, with the struggle with the platform's algorithm. Um, that I hope to show has some analytical purchase for thinking about labor capital relations in um, platform work and for challenging us to rethink what resistance can possibly look like online. Quickly, what is an Instagram influencer? Uh, an influencer is an independent content creator. They are sort of working at the margins of the cultural industries um, through their own social media activity. They amass a large or particularly valuable online following. Uh, and they earn an income by partnering with commercial brands and creating branded content that they promote to their own audiences through their Instagram accounts. So uh, in the literature thus far, you know, there's been a tendency to 
look at this through the lens of legacy industries, of modeling, acting, writing, um, and many of the critiques have sort of focused on the practices of reputation seeking, um, of self-presentation strategies that influencers tend to engage in. Um, but what I'm trying to forefront today is the centrality of that platform. Um, so when considering potential contracts, um, a brand will inevitably evaluate an influencer on, a basis, on the basis of their metrics uh, that come from Instagram. You know, what's the size of their following? Or what's their engagement rate? Um, what's their overall reach, et cetera. So the platform is really vitally important to an influencer's work. It acts as a type of algorithmic manager, um, or so I'm going to argue. Uh, it organizes the work, it measures their performance, and ultimately, it determines you know, the negotiating power that they have when they're uh, in discussions with brands about contracts. So in 2016, uh, the platform changed, as again, I'm sure many of you know. Instagram rolled out this curated newsfeed to replace the reverse chronological display. So before the change, uh, Instagram visually present presented these posts in reverse chronological order. The most recent posts appear at the top, um, and the older ones get pushed further and further down as more people you know, post new content. Then in 2016, uh, Instagram abandoned this simple reverse chronological presentation and replaced it with the curated feed that selects content deemed most relevant to each user uh, on the basis of a combination of the popularity of each post and each individual's usage history. So the change itself isn't necessarily surprising. Instagram um, is owned by Facebook and Facebook operates a similar one. You know, and these preference-driven algorithms are sort of designed to be sticky, uh, to keep people on the platform scrolling, liking and sharing, et cetera. But the content, creation, or content curation algorithms have been critiqued uh, as self-affirming echo chambers um, that paper over sort of the unanticipated with the predictable and the agreeable. But I'm suggesting here that Instagram's change in presentation strategy is just as much motivated uh, by organizing the productivity of its creators as much as it is about um, creating a sticky environment for its consumers. So prior to the change, these strategies for maximizing visibility and engagement um, was about knowing the interests and the habits of your user base. You know, what times are they looking and what sort of things are they interested in? Um, success was always fickle, but this labor process is relatively unambiguous. Uh, influencers understand the sort of techno-social mechanisms that organize it. And they created posting strategies to correspond. But the curated news feed has been sort of a game changer in this regard. Um, it means that an influencer's posts are no longer necessarily visible to all of their followers. Many content creators have reported drastic decreases in their reach and engagement metrics, uh, with some reports that posts on average reach about 10% of their total audiences. And so this obviously jeopardizes their sort of earning potential with advertisers. Um, furthermore, the precise equations and logics that govern the relationship between metrics is proprietary, and it's obscured from the Instagram community. So Instagrammers are obviously upset about this. Um, and their anxieties with, about the change have sort of been met with the platform saying, you know, in the new system, it's quality content that reigns supreme. You know, that inevitably, if you turn inwards, if you look to your own self and you work on your content, that you'll find the new mechanisms reward you um, appropriately. So I've been trying to put this in context with a sort of Harry Braverman kind of uh, framework and thinking about the dispossession of knowledge uh, of the labor process. So Harry Braverman describes the process whereby, you know, workers are systematically dispossessed of knowledge of the labor process. And the knowledge of work is sort of appropriated from the shop floor and made the exclusive purview of management. So this process leaves management with control over each step of the labor process and its mode of execution. And in the case of Instagram, under this new algorithmic management, uh, influencers have been dispossessed of that complete knowledge of the labor process. The ways in which their content is elevated and dispersed through the Instagram ecology has been complicated, automated, and black boxed. So by alienating workers from that knowledge of the worker process, the platform essentially intensifies the demand for constant productivity. Influencers know that they're not visible to all of their following, but they can't actually know when, for whom, and under what circumstances their content has been shown. Um, so they can't know when they've done enough. And there's a sort of a reverse panoptic kind of discipline that results here, that you must constantly generate content to maintain optimal visibility, visibility, optimal engagement metrics, and then consistent sponsorships from advertisers. 
So it's a sort of a common refrain in any trade literature that Instagram rewards consistency with visibility. Um, the corollary in that is that it can also punish inconsistency um, with by burying, burying your posts, torpedoing your engagement metrics, and then kind of jeopardizing your potential to earn an income from the advertisers. So in implementing this new form of black boxed algorithmic curation to the newsfeed, Instagram effectively consigns their influencers to the work of constant data production. Right. To the comment pods. So comment pods are sort of one grassroots um, tactical response that's been developed in response to this. It's an effort to sort of regain control over the Instagram ecosystem. So comment pods are sort of a subset of what's been called engagement groups, where groups of influencers kind of mutually agree to consistently comment on or like each other's posts, um, no matter what it is or what, whether or not they actually like it. Um, just depending on the expectations for the group, uh, members might be asked to like, share, save, um, depending on at the moment what people say the algorithm is most likely to pick up uh, and it changes rapidly and in response to how Instagram's algorithm is tweaked. So when a member of a group posts, other members are obliged to respond quickly and with messages of at least four words, um, always tailored to that content. That's a very important stipulation. You can't leave generic messages. Um, the prevailing knowledge is that, you know, real um, seemingly genuine engagement is going to trick the algorithm into picking these things up. Um, and the other thing is that you have to do this quickly. Um, within the first five minutes is the accepted knowledge that so long as the, um, the content generates a lot of engagement quite quickly, then, you know, you're more likely to, again, see that sort of amplified visibility and then increased engagement overall. So these groups can be pretty exclusive, um, particularly at the level of people who do this professionally as you know, influencers. Um, but I do want to highlight that they kind of exist um, at varying levels, right? People work as influencers um, for you know, things ranging from just product trades to you know, million dollar sort of deals. Um, so there's, there's certainly a range in how um, exclusive these groups can be and then who's allowed in each one. But at the level of people who do this professionally, it is difficult to get into them, I am finding. <laughs> um, but at base, uh, this mutual back scratching is sort of meant to inflate these engagement metrics so that your content is prioritized in the algorithm. And the goal is to improve uh, the odds that your content is visible to your followers and that it gets picked up in Instagram's explore page so that you can reach new followers. So whether or not comment pods actually um, achieve this goal is kind of an ongoing debate. Um, Instagram's algorithm is continually changing and responding to the gaming practices of its users and then the gaming practices of its users sort of change to respond to that in kind of an ongoing game of cat and mouse, which I find quite interesting. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that comment pods are sort of a worker-led cooperative algorithm hack designed to subvert the demands of Instagram platform labor. Um, that these are not sort of the artifact of social media narcissism or sort of internet celebrity culture. Um, I've been working on sort of taking them seriously. When they're understood from the perspective of that influencer, this is sort of a small-scale collective resistance against content selective algorithms that have effectively reconfigured their labor process in a way that allows Instagram to control and intensify the working day. So they constitute this small form of worker mobilization to maintain control over the labor process and to protect wages in the field of visibility labor. So while this is quite different from traditional forms of labor organizing um, for you know, control over the work and for higher wages, it's one that I think responds to the material conditions of their work, um, which are not really contained by the traditional parameters of an employee-employer sort of um, workday. Um, I just have one kind of final thought that's sort of a bigger, I don't know, taking a broader view on some of these practices that I think is interesting and something I'm sort of trying to develop as well. Um, I want to point out that these activities sort of rely on an underlying contradiction of the measurement and monetization of human expression and that, you know, social media sites kind of require. They rely on our sincere participation, social media sites, um, in order to be like a useful, saleable commodity uh, to advertisers. So they must then ask that we ignore the monetization um, of interactions and instead behave authentically, you know, which seems to sort of be a euphemism to, for 
behave as if the logics of you know, exchange do not undergird the activities that are going on online, which we all kind of at this point understand is not the case. Um, so this is kind of becoming a bigger and bigger ask. Uh, and the problem remains that it's very difficult to police sincerity, um, which is why all the efforts to sort of shut down comment pods and reconfigure the algorithm is not necessarily going to solve the problem. So I think comment pods represent the recognition that you know, those logics of necessary sort of being your authentic self or your real self, whatever that means. Um, they, and they capitalize upon a system that's sort of designed to datify, measure, and assign value to people. Um, in so doing, um, Comet Pads sort of destabilize the very business model of social media networks, um, or the platforms, sorry. They're sort of in danger of kind of turning into this hive of spammery, and I'm sort of curious to see how that ends up playing out. So that's all I kind of wanted to say today. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have uh, Rupa Vasudev Vasudevan. Vasudevan. I practiced it like eight <laughs> times. I really did. I was like, I don't want to mess it up. I'm so sorry. Who is an American artist, creative coder, and researcher whose work explores the influence that our increasingly digital way of life has on culture, politics, and real world behaviors, and the ways in which technology can reveal patterns and biases in our real life social systems. She is currently an assistant arts professor of interactive media arts at NYU Shanghai, and in the fall will be starting as a doctoral student at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Rupa, and I'm here to talk about my own practice. So I will open by saying that in addition to the academic research that I do, uh, my research is also very practice-based. So I uh, constantly exhibit and create work, um, and I kind of make work that also ties into the things that I'm writing about or thinking about as a scholar. Um, the artist practice kind of works together with that. And I'm going to be talking a project that I did about a project that I did in 2016 called Hashtag Bellwether. Um, I will explain more about what this photo actually means in a little bit. But basically, it was a project that was commissioned by Spaces in Cleveland, Ohio, which is one of the oldest alternative art spaces in the country, uh, during a residency that I was uh, working on concurrently with the RNC's presence in Cleveland in 2016. So the exhibition was kind of going on at the same time that the RNC was located in Cleveland and was running. Um, and so first, I just want to give you guys a little bit of context as far as what I was thinking when I went into this and kind of the research that I've done on this so far. So I'm going to start with the political public opinion process. So we've all seen things like this, right? This is Nate Silver's 538, um, kind of an aggregate of all of the horse race polls and the horse race tracking that goes into presidential polling and political polling in general. But in the 2016 election, um, starting with the primaries, we started to see things like this, right? Why the polls missed Bernie Sanders' Michigan upset. There was something similar that happened in California where Hillary Clinton did much better than she was supposed to do because it was forecasted that Bernie Sanders was gonna really take a big chunk out of her uh, numbers that she was going to get in the state. And obviously, we all know what happened with the general election. Um, all of the pollsters basically predicted a landslide Hillary Clinton victory. And instead, we ended up in the situation that we're in now. Um, so I wanted to think about this in terms of what public opinion polls are doing. There was a huge outcry, at, particularly after the election, uh, about how public opinion polling is wrong. It's outdated. We need a new system. Um, everybody's kind of uh, criticizing it and really you know, throwing it under the bus. And I wanted to take a look at what is going on here and kind of some new methods that we can use to gauge political opinion and political sentiment. So the first, the two main problems with public opinion polling is that people aren't picking up the phone. And when they do, they aren't given many options as far as how to, how to feel. So the reason that picking up the phone is a problem is because the majority of public opinion polling is conducted on landlines still. Um, it's actually illegal to robo-dial cell phones, although a lot of you may be seeing a problem with that. There's been an increased frequency in that lately, but as it stands, most pollsters will not use cell phones as a form of communication simply because they need to actually hire people to make these calls rather than farming it out to a whole bunch of machines to kind of send out automated messages. Um, this uh, kind of targets 
wealthier, uh, more conservative people, older people who tend to still have landlines installed and really kind of uh, takes away from the voices of the lower income minority people who rely more on mobile devices as a form of communication and their primary method of uh, internet and uh, phone engagement. Um, so what happens is there's a phenomenon called non-response bias where pollsters try to wait for the people who don't respond because the opinions of the people who actually do pick up the phone will be markedly different from those who do not pick up the phone. And this kind of leads to, in their efforts to kind of forecast and prognosticate about what those people who aren't responding actually will think, it leads to a lot of guesses and inaccuracy as far as what that polls actually say, whether or not they reflect the actual opinion of the people who are asked. Um, secondly, this is a screenshot uh, from the Pew Research Center leading up to the 2012 presidential election. Um, it's two questions that voters were asked on the phone. Uh, the first is, how much thought have you given to Tuesday's presidential election? And the second is, how closely have you been following news about the candidates? And you'll notice that there's five responses here. That's it. If you wanted to answer this question and you didn't want to fall into quite a lot, some, little, or none, your only option is to select don't know or refused. And this doesn't leave a lot of room for mixed feelings or really strong opinions that don't kind of fall into this category or kind of, well, I do like this person, but here's a lot of reasons why I feel kind of hesitant about them and so on and so forth. Instead, you're really constricted to a very narrow kind of dichotomy of emotion ranging from approval to disapproval and no room in between for any kind of things that deviate from that. Um, so social media has been talked about a lot in a bunch of contexts in political campaigns. We all know that social media is kind of used as a political campaign tool. This is a screenshot from the Wayback Machine um, of Barack Obama's tweet the night that he won in 2008. His campaign is really heralded as the kind of harbinger of a lot of new political campaign use of social media. Uh, but we're also starting to see people using social media as an alternative or even a replacement for traditional polling practices. So there have been a couple of, ooh, this is really blown out, but there have been a couple of instances where big companies have tried to do this. The first is the Twitter political index, which was used in 2012 for the 2012 election. And the second is a project by the Associated Press called the Election Buzz. The Twitter political index basically attempted to rank the sentiment of users talking about the political campaigns that were being held, but forced it into a really similar approval, disapproval structure in a very similar way to, get, uh, to traditional polls. You can see the blue is actually the Twitter index and the red is Gallup, right? And they really closely mirror each other because they're basically trying to do the same thing. The social media is being forced into this context that kind of really mirrors polling. And so it's kind of uh, being put into that same dichotomy of approval and disapproval. The second, the AP's project, does search for individual terms, but it adds no context to those terms. So for example, if you had somebody searching for Trump's Muslim ban, you didn't know whether or not somebody was for the ban or against the ban or was trying to look up more information about the ban to figure out what it was all about. All you had was that search term and all you got was a numerical graph of how often that term was searched for on these platforms, right? So my question is, what about individual voices? Social media is kind of this unprecedented way of millions and millions of people having their own individualized soapbox to kind of say whatever they want to say, right? And so how do we harness this really fickle and multifaceted nature uh, to get a better perspective on public opinion and the political process? So that leads me to this project, Hashtag Bellwether. Um, this uh, was kind of a response to this idea about Ohio's importance in the political process. I'm actually from Cleveland originally, so I have a very personal connection to this also. Ohio, as most of you know, is a bellwether state. Uh, it's used as kind of a uh, an oracle or, a, or kind of a predictor of who's actually going to win the presidential election. And so I wanted to get a sense of what these Ohio voters were actually thinking and whether or not I could use social media to kind of get a better read on what the kind of mood was surrounding the political campaigns in the primaries in 2016. So I started collecting data on August 6th, 2015, uh, which was the first Republican presidential debate. Uh, and I ended on July 12th, 2016, which was the day that Bernie Sanders endorsed Hillary Clinton for the Democratic nomination. Um, and I ran a, a, a really simple script that basically was designed to collect as many tweets as I possibly could that mentioned any of the presidential candidates by name. Keep in mind that at the beginning, when I started this script, there were 17 Republicans running for the nomination and five Democratic candidates. So I was searching for a lot of people. Um, 
And eventually, after the data was all filtered down to tweets that were geolocated to or specifically referencing Ohio, the number of Ohio-centric tweets I got was almost 15 million. So I had a really huge data set that I was able to work with. Um, then I ran them through a variety of algorithmic linguistic processes uh, in a Python script that I created myself, basically forcing the candidate's name into a variety of grammatical structures that you see here. I have this nifty laser pointer that I can use to do this. Um, so the candidate's name plus is plus an adjective or candidate's name plus is a plus a noun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a screenshot, again, really blown out of kind of a variety of things that I got about Ted Cruz in the month of March. And these are the kinds of things that I ended up with, right? Clinton is damned no matter what she wears. Trump is a disgrace. Cruz should be tried for treason. Uh, Clinton will say anything to win, which I'm going to come back to in a second. That's a very specific phrase uh, that I, I saw popping up over and over again. Sanders wants change. Rubio wants to be the GOP Barack Obama. And Kasich thinks a brokered convention would be fun. Um, and this kind of is, it's really gives you a lot more insight into what people are actually saying rather than I like Kasich or I hate Kasich, right? It really gives specifics, again, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so this is from a research trip that I took to the Cleveland City Club. They have a really huge political memorabilia collection that kind of dates all the way back to Andrew Jackson's political campaign in the 1800s. And I took this idea of political campaign merchandise as a method that campaigns are using to disseminate very specific curated messages, and I hacked it. So you can see here that these all have the same graphic identities as all of the campaigns, but they've been doctored to reflect what has been said about them on Twitter rather than the really, really highly vetted messages that traditionally appear. So you're used to seeing signs like this for Trump, but instead it says Trump is a liar because that's something that really appeared frequently throughout the process. Um, and I made a hierarchy to determine what kind of merchandise I was making for various points in the campaign. The campaign button was the lowest tier because it was just really cheap and easy for me to make them in bulk. I had a machine. I could turn out hundreds of them in an hour. It was really simple. Bumper stickers came next because all I had to do was make the Illustrator file and feed it into an inkjet printer. Um, then came the rally signs that I had custom made. Um, lawn signs, which I had custom made and then assembled myself. Um, I'm missing the t-shirt slide here, but if we go back to this first slide, the t-shirts came on the next tier, right? Because I had to do the heat transfer myself. Um, and then finally, for the tweets that ended up being super popular and really exponentially off the charts, I made a two-dimensional proof of specialty merchandise that related specifically to each campaign that if somebody wanted to buy it, I would then custom make for them at the end of the exhibition. So for example, this references Trump's famous Cinco de Mayo photograph. Somebody noticed that he was eating a taco salad on top of an old newspaper article about his ex-wife Marla Maples in a bikini. And so Trump is eating a taco salad on top of a bikini-clad photo of his ex-wife, got 5,809 mentions in the May data, and thus merited a proof of a, a doctor Doctor would make America great again hat. Um, and so this kind of points out to a thing. I mentioned that you got a better sense of what people actually were talking about in reference to these candidates, but you also had multiple tweets that were saying pretty much the exact same thing in different ways. So you have things like Hillary is a liar and Hillary will say anything to win. Both of them are basically saying the same thing, but one of them is acting very, very specific and is referencing specific ways that they saw Hillary Clinton behaving during the campaign and what they thought about that behavior, right? Rather than just a generic statement. This also points to the fact that there were like, two types of data that I saw frequently recurring throughout the process. The first is a really generic statement, like Hillary is a liar, that appeared in a multitude of fashions throughout all of the data that I collected. The second is a highly specifically worded statement that is evidence of a mass retweet. And so the bikini, uh, the bikini clad photo of his ex-wife comment is another specific one. It got 5,809 mentions. It's probably because one person tweeted it and then 5,000 people thought it was resonant enough to amplify in that one month. The second is phrases that have a very specific cultural meaning that would not be really found or flagged by an algorithm. So you guys all know what this is. This is Ted Cruz is a Zodiac killer. Um, this would not necessarily have been flagged by a sentiment algorithm, right? Maybe killer would have brought something up, but really to understand this, you need a human reading it because then they can put the actual cultural reference together with the candidate and infer what Ted Cruz actually 
seemed like or what that tweeter or what the person who was tweeting actually thought about Ted Cruz from this statement. Um, so the project, it started kind of as an examination of public opinion, but it really ended up uh, as a tribute to the diversity of opinions in Ohio and kind of thinking about social media, not necessarily in the same context that we've been examining public opinion polls, but thinking about it in a new way and whether or not we can actually use language and context to evaluate social media in its own right as and as its own its own entity kind of divorced from all of the previous historical readings of political public opinion data. Um, so that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Joseph Meyer is doctoral student in American studies at UMD. His research interests broadly include digital studies, emerging media, identity and community formation, trauma studies, and game studies. His current work examines social media and shifting conceptions of power and privilege and the material consequences of these shifts. So, hi everybody, I'm Joseph. Um, and I actually just wanted to ask a real quick question before we started. How many of you have actually heard about review bombing before? Okay, I'm slightly shocked, mainly because when I started doing this research, uh, when I just was thinking about this, and I'll talk about this in a minute, like even Urban Dictionary hadn't heard of review, <laughs> review bombing. So it was very odd because this is, this is something that I've seen happening for like the last decade, but it, it isn't actually within sort of like the internet spectrum. So um, yeah, so this is gonna be kind of like a wild ride because I'm gonna try to explain what it is, give you some examples, and then get to my ultimate argument. So hopefully I can do this in 15 minutes. It might be a little uh, kinetic, but we'll see, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, but the first thing I wanna do is actually start off with a story. Um, and this happened like literally like a day before the uh, call for papers for Theorizing the Web was due, and I was listening to Pod Save America. And there was uh, an advertisement for um, the Cash App. I don't know how many people listen to Pod Save America, they're talking about the Cash App. And then they go into a tangent about something that happened in Cafe Milano in Washington DC with Jose Andreas. Um, does everybody know about Jose Andreas? Uh, he's a famous chef, he's been working with, uh, uh, working in Puerto Rico, he's like, he's like fed more people than the government at this point. Um, he also pulled out his restaurant from the Trump Towers, so there's a very heated exchange. And basically what ends up happening is, this is super blown out, so this is gonna suck, but um, ultimately, uh, <laughs> he tweets out after he tries to go to a private party at Cafe Milano in early January, or late January, saying, I've been denied access because Ivanka Trump said so. Um, everybody else goes in, I don't. Uh, this picks up, goes a little bit viral, people get upset, and they start bombing the Cafe Milano review pages, and, okay, so you can't see anything. <laughs> but basically, there, it was actually kind of small, there was only 15 reviews that go up that are all one stars, basically complaining about the bad food. Um, there is one, however, that is up here that contextualizes that they say, I can't believe that this establishment would do that to someone as great as Jose Andres, right? So. This happens, their Yelp scores get slammed a little bit and it turns into a little thing, but then we find out that it's much to do about nothing. Uh, Cafe Milano contacts um, Jose Andreas, they say, we're sorry, it was a misunderstanding. He puts it in quotes, then Ivanka reaches out to him and says, it wasn't me. Um, there's actually a follow-up tweet where he's like, well, it might be you, but <laughs> it might be your friends, whatever. But this sort of like goes to show like sort of kind of how this like review bombing campaigns can happen. Um, and ultimately this triggered in me sort of like this idea about what review bombs are. Um, and I started thinking back to what I've seen that practice, which is in the gaming culture space. So this happens a lot with games and we're gonna talk about that for a little bit just to contextualize it. But before I do that, I wanted to talk about sort of my approach to the internet, because it's really interesting because we're, we're like looking at a specific platform, we're talking about data. And then for me, I go the opposite spectrum of just trying to read myself and follow all these networks of influence and connection. Okay, and a lot of this is based on um, this idea called affective practice by Margaret Wetherill, which is basically thinking about like different things that, that an event that makes things happen and then you follow all the things that both went into it and come out of it. And it's like this, this web of things um, uh, that is exciting and terrifying and, and makes you go, huh, and this Jose Andreas thing made me go, huh. Right, and then in order to actually analyze these things, I practice um, Bruno Latour's actor network theory, which is basically the sociological concept of tracing associations, creating like almost like an actual literal 
mapping of these controversies. Um, so what I like to do is I like to sort of like pair all the links, all the connections, all the ways that culture influences these sort of like interactions, right? And then finally, in order to sort of get into analyzing these pieces, I use Andre Brock's critical techno-cultural discourse analysis, much easier to say with CTDA. But basically, uh, this is um, actually an analysis that he is he's developed, he's got a paper out, and I think he's writing a book on it. Um, pretty awesome, check out Andre Brock. But basically, his whole um, thing is making sure that, you, that you, you privilege the platform as well as the discourse, all right? And each platform in and of itself shifts those discourses based off of those users and the interactions, okay? So we're talking about, you know, like algorithms and platforms, but it's also the platforms themselves and the users, okay? And so with review bombing, what I'm looking at is actual reviews. How are people using reviews to sort of create a discourse, right? Um, and just to give you a definition that I've sort of come up with, because uh, when I did this research, A, Urban Dictionary failed me, and then both Wikipedia and Know Your Meme are only based around games, which it does originate in gaming culture. Um, but yeah, so what is review bombing? It is the act of posting mass negative reviews about something online, either through organizing or bots in order to harm its popularity or sales. Review bombing is primarily related to expressing dissatisfaction with the group or creator of the thing and not necessarily the thing itself. Um, and I kind of struggle with this, like I use thing mainly because we're talking about the internet where we have objects, but we've also commodified the self, we've commodified services, we've commodified just the influencing itself. So. And, and not necessarily that product or service that you do translates to the reviews that you get, all right? So this all starts with Spore. Um, does anybody remember Spore from 2008? Uh, you know, the, the, the galaxy simulator, basically. Um, and what ends up happening is in 2008, people get very upset um, and they bomb the crap out of this thing on Amazon. Uh, it's actually, there's almost 3,500 customer reviews and there's 76% one stars. I don't know how that thing's three and a half stars, to be perfectly honest at this point. But every single one was rallying against a feature in the game called digital rights management. It's a piece of software that makes it so you can't copy it. It's fighting piracy. So most gamers that were buying Spore, they didn't really like the gameplay that much either, but it was mainly against this added software, this practice. So they're actually responding not necessarily to the software itself, but to the practice of digital rights management. Um, and this explodes into this Spore-based thing. Fast forward to like, I don't know, like six, seven years later, I don't know. Oh no, actually 2017, nine years later time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so last September, um, there was a developer who sends out this tweet saying, we're filing a DMCA takedown of PewDiePie's Firewatch content for any future Campo Santo games. Translation, <laughs> Firewatch is a game um, that is actually, it was a pretty critically acclaimed, acclaimed game when it came out back in 2016. Um, and Sean Veneman is one of the developers in Campo Santo who produced this game. And PewDiePie is a famous YouTuber um, and influencer on that platform. And he has been in a little bit of hot water in a lot of spaces. Um, he had a lot of content with uh, jokes about Nazis. And then this was actually something that comes after that where he used a racial slur on his game stream. And basically, Veneman decided that his game was, never, was not going to be monetized anymore through PewDiePie's plays. So DMCA takedowns, for those of you don't, that don't know, any creator can claim uh, a copyright infringement on creators on YouTube in order to get it taken down, and it's actually a huge issue. So this is where all these platforms start interacting, and it's weird, right? So what ends up happening, though, is gamers revolt. They go onto the Steam platform, which is a digital distribution platform for games, and start posting hundreds of thousands, well, actually, it's about 1,500 reviews, I can't say thousands. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, quali let's qualify that, about how, oh, that one was my favorite, I wanna save it for later, but you know, like how they love the game, but the developers broke their heart. The ideological spectrum has been broken, right? They're, they're saying that instead of focusing on the games, on the products, you have broken the pack that you've made with streamers, with gamers, by saying that you don't support the way that we express ourselves, so we're going to economically damage you, right? And so this is kind of a shift in something from just the product itself, or at least something tangentially related to the actual developers of that product. Um, and you know, the, my, my favorite one was the SJWs are ruining everything, which is a common frame phrase in a lot of these reviews, okay? All this to say is this is kind of where review volume comes from. 
And what Steam ends up doing is it actually fundamentally changes its system for rating and reviewing, where it makes only people who buy on the platform able to actually post reviews. And then they also have these uh, histograms that show you these, these um, review bombs. And you can see, like, when it came out in 2016, it was pretty, pretty highly rated. Nobody really cared. And then right in September, they get this massive drop. All right, And the idea is that this actually shows you how these review bang campaigns occur. Um, Sorry, I kept my hand on this, so if I just lasered anybody, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is where we are with review bombs. So this got me thinking, where do reviews appear? What do they mean? How do they function in our like internet economy, right? And I came up with this huge list of all these good things um, that are not so good, too, if you start really thinking about it, right? Um, and thinking through the sort of ways in which the bedrock principles of a lot of our online economies are based in places like Amazon or eBay, where reviews are like critical to their success, right? When Amazon came out in 95, everyone was like, I can't believe that you're allowing both positive and negative reviews. Um, when eBay comes out, it takes them two years, and then they introduce uh, seller reviews in 97. So this turns into this issue where all of these platforms are basing these things off of user reviews in this sort of techno-libertarian utopia where everybody is a rational cons consuming thinker, right? And the issue is, is when we have things that are also coming back into the real world through Amazon Books, where only books with 4.6 ratings or above are featured, um, you can have things like review bombing campaigns that will actually stop the, the at least, you know, IRL manifestation in stores on things like this. So it starts thinking about the fact that if we're building these platforms on the rationalization that we're all just consuming beings that can give sort of unbiased, objective accounting of reviews, that's all fine, but we're not, right? We, we are sort of like able to sort of react to these things. And this becomes issues in a lot of the platforms that we're using today. Um, things like prejudices that play out in our, um, in Uber, right? Like. Uh, Lower, lower ratings for um, black and women drivers. Um, the Amazon fake reviews, I, I, I literally just saw a television, like I think it was like in Good Morning America on Tuesday where they were saying there hasn't been like a real influx of reviews on Amazon since 2016 that aren't fake, which is bad, right? Um, and actually the storming a book online is really interesting because it was about a book in I think 2013 with Michael Jackson where they actually sort of review bombed it like the fans because it was a, like, painting a not so positive picture about him. So all of these things sort of like go into the ways that these reviews operate. And beyond that too, we also like to play online, all right? Many people will remember the Three Wolf Moon shirt. You know, these reviews are, are, are sort of like internet legend in the sense of the fun, you know? And also Marlon Bundo, which man, every, all of my pictures are white and it's blown out and it stinks. But if everybody knows about Marlon Bundo, uh, John Oliver's new book, not only do, does it have almost unanimous five-star reviews, but then it has about 3% one-star reviews. But they're not review bombing. They're trolling the hate readers that are trying to find negative reviews by saying, I can't believe how pleased I am for this opportunity to buy this book and promote the freedom, right? Um, people will really hate this if you give this book to the local library, right? So it's actually, it's actually a reversal of review bombing in order to like, go against hate readers, right? So all of these things are going on. And ultimately, this brings me to my last point and sort of the larger argument slash question that I got brought to about sort of how we can think of review bombing as sort of like these, these reactionary consumer activist moments. Not necessarily movements, but moments, right? Um, I just thought of that. That's weird. Anyways, um, <laughs> this uh, is, you can't, you probably can't read the whole thing, but it's a new, it's a Facebook group that actually just recently got reinstated, which is kind of weird, but uh, it's called Down With Disney's Treatments of Franchises and Its Fanboys. Um, and the, I, I don't go there, because they're actually doing a campaign right now to spoil Avengers Infinity War. And if you're like me, you're not going till Sunday night, and you're sad about it. So I have to avoid the internet at Theorizing the Web. But um, you know, basically, they uh, are their, their, their main goal is to um, speak out and say that there's nothing wrong with being a straight, white, male person um, in representation. And, this group has claimed responsibility for the review bombing campaign against The Last Jedi, um, which has a 91% Rotten Tomato meter, but then its audience score is sitting at 47% with, like, I think it's 100, like, I, I can't even read that. 191,000 reviews, most of which are one star and half stars. 
um, very few with more content than I can't believe they don't have white guys or SJWs are ruining, SJWs are ruining everything, all that kind of stuff. So ultimately, they claimed responsibility for that using bots um, and also organizing campaigns like one that they tried to do for Black Panther, um, which was tweeted out um, that also had about 3,500 people that had joined to actually do this, this review bomb of Black Panther when it came out. Um, ultimately, it got shut down um, and Facebook shut down the group. They're suddenly back um, just recently, which was great for me because I had that slide, which is still blown out, so I guess it's not that great. But it's not good because of the ways that platforms are actually like taking responsibility for these actions. But uh, they also still claim responsibility for getting Black Panther to 79% review score, which, is at, which they say is below Wonder Woman. This is also a, a DCEU feud. Um, so part of it's alt-right white male conspiracy. The other part is DCEU fanboys are mad that their movies aren't getting rated as, as high. Um, so, you know, ultimately, the, the ways that these emotions play out on these online platforms becomes um, issues both in visibility but also can have real world consequences as we start seeing the ways that these different platforms are sort of like going through our lives. Um, and ultimately, this was a journey to the question and not necessarily an answer to it, but something through that observation of going through these little lines of, of networks and, and connections. Um, and ultimately, I hope that this gets you thinking a little bit more about when you're rating and reviewing. Um, I sure do. Um, and with that, I hope you rate, review, subscribe, like, and share with your friends. Thank you. Ali Raj is a journalist and musician enrolled at Columbia Journalism School. He has experience in television production, newspaper and magazine journalism, and his research interests include piracy and inf informality, excuse me, in the culture industry of the global south. He also has a rock band that puts canonized Urdu poetry to music. So, uh, my name is Ali Raj and uh quote Henry VIII, uh, I shall not keep you long. My line of inquiry has been slightly uh, different from those of uh, my fellow panelists here. I'm a journalist primarily and a musician from Pakistan. Um, I've been doing this work for the past seven years. Uh, my interest in sort of the workings of the Pakistani music industry. Uh, I sort of got interested in, in, in them because uh, it's, it's both a passion project that's personal and professional. I became a musician and then I realized that there was no real means of making money or distribution of music in Pakistan. So I became a journalist and several years later I realized that there's no money in journalism either. <laughs> so uh, after seven years I'm standing at a point where there are only two things that I'm good at and I can make money from either. But uh, jokes apart, uh, one of my mentors uh, was killed by the Taliban in 2016. Um, I come from a country, most of you know, which is usually in the news for its violence and political instability. Um, since 9-11, about 80,000 people, and that's that's a pretty low figure, that's that, that's sort of an estimated 80,000 people have died uh, in, in violence and political instability, and that just continues to be the same. How that's connected to, the, to Pakistani music is extremely interesting, um, because uh, of late, uh, religious extremists have been directly targeting musicians, and that has sort of endangered, and that, that's one of the reasons why, why this has become more of a, an existential question for me, and uh, that's how I began investigating it um, as well. So just to give you a background of, 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 of uh, the part of the world that I come from, uh, Pakistan gained independence, uh, India gained independence from British colonizers in 1947. Um, two independent countries were formed, Pakistan and India. Um, so the announcement of the making of Pakistan was uh, made on state radio. Um, uh, Pakistan inherited a fragmented media landscape in the sense that uh, whatever India, little India had in terms of its media uh, uh, facilities, they were divided between the two countries. So Pakistan had a small time radio station. Uh, and during the early years, musicians were sort of hired by the music, uh, music station. And uh, it, it used to record and air their music. There was no concept of mixing or mastering music or production of any 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 sort. It was all live recorded and aired. Um, Pakistan also inherited part of the Indian film industry, which is today one of the world's largest producers of cinema. Um, one of the one of the major centers of Indian cinema was uh, a, a city that's based in, uh, that's now part of present-day Pakistan, which is the city of Lahore. So um, film production houses were present there, and they were the ones who were sort of helping these musicians uh, gain some momentum, find jobs with, with state radio. So that was primarily uh, how, how things began in Pakistan. What's, what's been extremely interesting in the music industry and in the culture industry itself is that there has always been a monopoly of one person or one, one person or the other. So initially, for the first 30 or 40 years, uh, it was state radio and uh, a 
a record label by the name of EMI, you might have heard of it. Uh, the Pakistan operation of EMI sort of uh, signed an agreement with State Radio, um, and EMI would scout, hunt artists, record them, archive their music, and the State Radio would distribute it. Pakistan uh, got television in 1964, and that's when the distribution model really sort of revolutionized in the sense that um, these musicians, earlier you could only hear their voices, but now you could also see them, and uh, they were primarily musicians that came from classical and folk genres. Um, so that happened, and uh, this was a virtual monopoly in the sense that uh, these EMI was producing music, state TV and radio were distributing it, there was no other player in the industry, and that continued until the arrival of the CD, in, uh, CD and cassettes in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, Pakistan's CD business is actually extremely interesting in the sense that uh, it's, the story starts uh, from the Middle East, which is Dubai. Um, there was a time in, in the late 80s and early 90s when Dubai was attracting immigrant workers from all over South Asia and East Asia. Um, the city where I come from, uh, it's a city of about 25 million people. It's a port city, uh, one of the, la the largest city in Pakistan, Karachi. Um, there's a business, there's an ethnic group in that city, which, uh, which is sort of um, very politically and religiously conservative. They call them Memons. Um, and they're primarily uh, business-oriented people. So uh, this one particular gentleman by the name of Khalid Sadaf, uh, I'm going to show you a picture of his. Oh, this is uh, pixelated, but this is the handsome gentleman in, in black, which uh, you can clearly make out. Um, so he, uh, he, he left Pakistan for Dubai in, in the late 80s to find, to find work, and he returned uh, with, with a few CDs and a CD player uh, for, his, for his kids. Uh, this community was sort of very tightly knit in the, in the sense that um, they had these stage shows, a very local form of theater that they would uh, conduct in Karachi. And for, for many of the families that had moved to the Middle East, what they would do is they would record uh, those, th those shows on, on VHS cassettes and they would send those tapes to the Middle East just so that they could keep in touch with what was going on back home. Uh, so this was, this, was, this was sort of a the initial year. So he came back with CDs, he sold them to a few friends. They really liked the idea of uh, a new medium of distribution. And uh, this guy uh, thought that uh, his family hated him for doing all of this because they despised music and musical cultures. But he thought that um, it's, a, it's sort of selling CDs is a good way of uh, being able to afford his frequent trips to Dubai from Pakistan. So he set up a shop in Karachi, in, in, in the industrial uh, complex of, of, of the city. And uh, he started selling those CDs, started to bring them regularly. Um, at that time, CDs were primarily manufactured in East Asia, which is um, Singapore primarily. So they were importing CDs from Singapore to the Middle East, and then he would bring them to Pakistan. Those CDs contained Hollywood content, um, Bollywood content, like Indian cinema, which the Pakistani audiences could relate to in terms of linguistic and cultural similarities. Um, so here, the point that I got that got me really interested in all of this is that. Traditionally, and this is this is, uh, and I I I I draw from the wellspring of uh, anthropologist uh, Arjun Apadurai's work, which uh, sort of he he lays out the broad idea that traditionally disembedded societies, when they want to participate in an international consumer culture, in the immediacy of an international consumer culture, they sort of tend to shift towards pirate infrastructures, which he calls them, which are sort of these informal methods and networks through which, like for instance, uh, Park, there is, at the moment, there is no legal way of watching Game of Thrones in Pakistan, but that doesn't really mean that Pakistanis aren't consuming Game of Thrones. So that, that was essentially the idea uh, for these people. They would bring in Hollywood films, Bollywood films, and the method uh, was very efficient. The network was extremely large, the, the valuation of the CD piracy black mar ma uh, market was somewhere between two to five billion dollars. They had their uh, network spread across the world. So these Pakist Pakistani series by the mid 2000s uh, were sort of confiscated in about 40 countries of the world. And that's when these governments really started to put pressure on Pakistan to take action against them. Now, the pirate that I just that I wanted to show you here, um, this gentleman here, uh, he was sort of the benevolent criminal of his time. Uh, he was Pakistan's largest taxpayer, so all of his business was completely legal. Um, he would make money off uh, by pirating Hollywood content and Bollywood content, and he would pump that money into Pakistan's legitimate music industry. So what was happening at that time was, if you're a musician, you can just go walk up to him, and like he's in this picture, he's surrounded by some of the very famous musicians at that time. If you're a musician, you don't have any money, you can just walk up to him, he's gonna give you bags of cash, to record and produce your music, and once you're done, you can come back with a CD. He's going to make copies of those CDs and distribute them all over the world. That was essentially the idea. Uh, there was no paperwork involved. It was all word of mouth, all informal, um, and that's what uh, sparked the interest of many international governments as well. Um, so. 
keep in mind that this was a time in pakistan uh, this was this is all post 911 this was a time in pakistan there was intense pressure on the pakistani government to start military operations in the bordering areas of pakistan and afghanistan against the taliban of course and the pakistani government had already begun to do so um so what the FBI did, so there were, there were several complaints officially sent to the Pakistani government. Uh, there was a congressional delegation that came to Pakistan. Uh, they tried to uh, get in touch through the World Trade Organization. And then finally, the FBI sent a, a detailed uh, dossier of documents. They linked, established a link between the Siri pirates and the Taliban. So the theory was that the music that was being made through the music and film industry, the distribution of pirated series was being sent back to Afghanistan and Pakistan, the bordering region, uh, to fund the war, uh, to fund the Taliban's uh, fight in the war on terror. And that uh, sort of, so, so that, that's, that kind of pressure forced the Pakistani government's hand. They launched uh, an operation in 2005, which is also the year that Pakistan's GDP growth rate was at its highest in its history. It hasn't peaked uh, uh, to, to that extent as yet. So when Donald Trump says that uh, uh, a lot of money was paid to Pakistan, that is partially true because between 2002 and 2008, approximately $12 billion were given to Pakistan in the war on terror, and that's a lot of money. So the Pakistani government decided to take action against uh, these people, and the military intelligence was tasked with taking care of them, which has absolutely no jurisdiction over this matter. Um, they launched uh, an anti-piracy operation, which was the largest in Pakistan's history and one of the largest uh, across the world. Uh, I'll just give you some quick statistics about, about the size of this and the scale of their operations. So the International uh, Federation of Phonographic Industry, which sort of protects the interests of record labels, they said that uh, these factories, and there were 10 factories, all of them owned by, the, by people from the same community, uh, uh, Khalid Sadaf's friends, relatives, um, they were producing approximately 230 million CDs every year. Uh, the dent uh, that they had on, 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 the, on the record label business across the world was over $150 million, and that was only by this one individual. So if you, if you combine the figures from all of the others, it's go this goes to several billion dollars. Uh, so that happened, and then, and then the Pakistani government shut all of these factories down. As a result of which, the Pakistani music industry today has absolutely no <coughs> infrastructure, whether that's legal or illegal, in terms of music distribution. Uh, here's, uh, here's some uh, comparative statistics that I want to show you. Um, in 2004, if you can see, um, Pakistan, uh, these, these pirates were, were making a killing. And uh, uh, 2005 is the year when this action is taken. But all of a sudden, in 2006, there's a spike in, in, the, in, in the money that they were making. So essentially, what the government did was, because this was the time when CD was all the rage uh, in, in that part of the world, and if any of you is interested in how this sort of had an effect on the broader culture industry of the Global South, you should check out the work of anthropologist Brian Larkin of Columbia University. He's worked on the Nigerian film industry, which is also one of the world's largest. The Pakistani pirates helped that's the, the Nigerian film industry sort of gain momentum by sending these CDs from Pakistan. Uh, through the sea route. So um, in 2006, what the Pakistani government and uh, all, the, all the other governments that were sending these complaints to the Pakistani government thought was that they would uh, stop this, this from happening. It just, they just opened up a hornet's nest. Uh, there were CD pirates everywhere in every street, every shop, and uh, this, is, uh, this spike clearly shows how, uh, how good they were doing back then. Following which, um, several years later, CD uh, was no longer uh, in fashion, and uh, that sort of led a, uh, left a void in the Pakistani music industry. Here's a screenshot of a music show that's sponsored by the Coca-Cola company. This is uh, so. I'm these days I'm investigating uh, the Coca-Cola company's influence in Pakistan, and it's extremely interesting in the sense that uh, post 2008, violence has peaked in Pakistan. So there's no concept of live shows or anything whatsoever. It's just getting slightly better nowadays, but there's still a long way to go. I'm sure you've heard of the many organized assaults that have happened over the past few years. Hundreds of People have died in them. There was an attack on a school uh, three years ago where about 150 school children were slaughtered. So that's, that's the extent of violence that's been happening. So um, the, the culture industry has sort of come to a standstill. Um, there is no legal or illegal method of distributing uh, film and music. So in a situation like this, a company like the Coca-Cola steps in, makes a killing of the situation, and becomes Pakistan's most popular soft drink. Pepsi has dominated the, uh, the soft drink market in that part of the world for the past 60 years, and uh, since ever since this music show has begun. So the Coca-Cola model here is that they bring these artists on board, they pump 
millions of dollars into it. The music is produced, it's distributed across television and radio channels. It's available for free downloads everywhere. So you, you, you literally cannot escape Coke Studio in that part of the world when it's airing. Uh, that's how it is. And by not escaping Coke Studio, I also mean that you cannot escape Coca-Cola, which is today the most popular soft drink. So this is the sort of uh, story of how a monopoly has shifted in Pakistan and, and one of the world's largest CD empires came crashing now. Thank you so much. Great, so thank you so much to the panel. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, that was the first hand. Uh, th thanks again to the panel. All of those were great talks. Um, I, I have a question for Rupa. Um, so I'm curious, have you, um, in light of the revelations about Russian botnets, um, have you gone back and uh, cross-checked your data and seeing to see which, if any, of those things you investigated and maybe printed uh, were being pushed by R Russian and other botnets? Um, so that's a really good question, and that's a question that I get pretty much every single time I talk about this project, especially in light of recent events. Um, I have not done an extensive cross-check at this point, only because my life has gotten sucked up into a lot of things. Um, but I think the interesting thing about the project is that even if the original source of a tweet was a bot, and even if you know a, a chunk of the retweets were a bot, in order to make it into kind of the data, it also had to be retweeted by a bunch of other real life people too. So I think that that's also significant. Um, the originator of the tweets may not have all necessarily been human, but the fact that they kind of escalated to the point that they did in the data to varying degrees mean, meant that people found them, agreed or disagreed with them enough to amplify them to that extent. Um, so I do think it is still um, an interesting reflection on what people were actually thinking at the time. And also this was the prime so this kind of, um, you know, it's it's yet to be said. There was a obviously there was a very significant influence in Russian uh, interference during the general election, um, during the primaries because of the volume of the candidates and the amount that people were talking about the volume of the candidates. And because I started before it was significant that Trump was going to win, and before anybody had any idea that that was going to happen, um, we might not see that to as an insane degree had I done this project during the general election. Um, this question is about the Instagram um, comment pods. Uh, I'm very interested in the in the parallel as between what they're doing and and um, labor organizing. Um, but an interesting difference is that the people paying them are not the the people against whom they're organizing. They're organizing against a platform here, and which is a, a third party. Um, and so, I'm wondering whether whether the, so that introduces this weird dynamic where the platform is ostensibly trying to h help their, you know, there, there's not the adversarial relationship between like labor and capital as there is between Instagram and Instagram influencers. Um, but is there a sense with which uh, so we saw the 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 pushback against the non chronological timeline? Is there is there organized pushback against the introduction of new analytics generally? Is it the analytics that, that impose those new costs? And is there organization that's aimed at the platforms more specifically? Yeah, thank you for that question, actually. Um, I've been thinking about that sort of triad of this sort of labor relationship um, in that, you know, you have the advertiser who actually pays for the work, the Instagrammer who does the work, and then the platform on and through which the work is done. Um, so it is sort of an interesting moment of, um, you know, what I'm talking about is algorithmic management. Um, I mentioned briefly in there that, you know, they, it is sort of the platform's job to set the pace of production, um, to organize how the work is done. Um, and so, yeah, in that interesting way, it does play a very specific and unique role, I suppose, for their work. Um, as far as organizing against sort of, you know, the metrification of what they do, right, because there's something intangible about influence. Um, not that I've seen, um, and, you know, I'd be curious if anybody has, you know, any instances of that. Um, what I will say, though, it's, it's interesting to hear influencers talk about uh, their relationship with the platform um, and and how that's, you know, they don't see, well, I'll say this. I think the potential for resistance, you know, when you're talking about like an influencer's work uh, in relation to a platform, I think, 
is in the way that, you know, they don't see any loyalty to the platform. The platform is sort of a tool. It's sort of this neutral um, thing that they kind of work through. Um, and I think in that, there's un sort of a unique space to kind of organize and think of these creative ways to kind of undermine how it organizes their work. Um, um, but at the same time, it's very difficult to sort of, you know, have some sort of collective um, organizing against a tool, um, you know? <laughs> that it's also not an adversarial sort of relationship that they see there. So the, it's sort of an ambiguous kind of space, and I think it's a unique kind of moment early on to sort of capture how they articulate, um, you know, what that relationship is, um, and if it's adversarial or if it's sort of, you know, this beautiful thing that has sort of helped them gain the followers that they have and have the life that they do. Um, so, so the short answer to your question is no. <laughs> there's not really sort of an organized... Um, effort to combat that sort of metrification of, um, of influence. Um, but there are a lot of really interesting ways that people are sort of undermining uh, the platform through, you know, bots is an interesting one too. I think there's some potential for labor organizing in bots, um, just in the way that it allows us to log off um, and sort of, you know, automates that process of constant interactivity that influencers often find that they have to engage in. Uh, it's sort of part of the job. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Uh, Rupa, I have a question about sort of the, the materiality of your output. Um, I'm really fascinated whether or not, like when that cruise is the, is the Kodiak killer, or is it, excuse me, Zodiac killer came up, we were all, that was, you know, got a good laugh. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that what we were reacting to or what your audience in the piece reacts to more is the fact that it um, takes on the branded aspect of the campaign or the material aspect of the paraphernalia that is I see it in a hat I see it in a t-shirt or I see it in the cruise logo. I see it in the Hillary logo So I think it's a combination of both um, I think that people One react to just generally, you know this idea of culture jamming objects that we see Every day and you know, there's a whole kind of art study of culture jamming and kind of taking on things that are prevalent in everyday life And then tweaking them to reflect the opposite or to subvert them or to kind of present an alternative viewpoint So I think people inherently respond to that but then I also think that people immediately afterwards people kind of like jump to, oh, what if somebody was actually wearing that as a campaign button? Or, oh, what if somebody was actually wearing that as a t-shirt? Um, and so I think that being able to physically see it in the real world kind of takes this content that if we were to see it online, we just kind of brush it off as like, oh, you know, that's just another person tweeting something stupid, like whatever, it's not a big deal. Um, and then really actually seeing it on a physical object puts it in a different context and makes us think about it and appreciate it a little bit more. Um, and that kind of speaks to the exhibit itself. So I had people coming in through there who would then come up to me afterwards and say, it took a really long time for me to find anything that I actually agreed with in here. And they would spend hours and hours and hours looking through all of the material the final installation like had all the lawn signs throughout the gallery on the floor I mounted them on like foam to represent AstroTurf right um, and they would take hours to look through everything in the gallery and they were like I can't find anything that I agree with and so I think that materiality also and being able to look at things in a 3D physical space kind of makes people question their own bubbles online and makes people think about the the, the content that they encounter on their kind of really curated timelines and people agree with everything and bringing it into the real world not only kind of makes them think about it in a different way, but also kind of alerts them to the fact that in the real world, you might not be sitting next to somebody who really agrees with you the way that somebody who's next to you on your Facebook timeline does. Hi, uh, it's just, I've just been looking at the Coke Studio picture sat at the back there and just wondering, um, what sort of content do you feel that Coke are pushing, um, you know, that are favoring on their platform now? Considering, I mean, just looking at those, the arrangement of, of instruments there suggests a very certain um, uh, disposition in regarding to things like uh, harmonic uh, scales and structure and tradition and, and forms of making music, which uh, which represent like a, a traditionally like Western range, particularly if like for like coax music for their adverts, for example, would all be using those sorts of, of instruments, uh, at least all the ones I've ever heard have. So I just wonder whether or not you see a trend uh, in how Coca are actually pushing this new content out. 
So um, primarily the idea with, the, with this show is fusion music. They're sort of trying to uh, record Pakistan's musical heritage. And by that I also mean India's musical heritage. So what they're trying to do here is that uh, there are certain folk genres, there are certain genres of Indian classical music that have in the past not been explored to that extent. And a lot of people both home and outside at home and outside Pakistan, they're not really aware of uh, these kind of musical cultures. So what through Coke Studio, what they try to do is um, they use both established artists and then people from these folk genres from rural areas, they bring them to the, to the studio and it's sort of a fusion of, they have a local instrument, they will have something that's like an instrument that's been there for thousands of years in, in that part of the world and then they'll fuse it with, with, with guitars and modern production techniques. So it's very slick, but at the same time, it's also very local and uh, there's, there's been a sort of, uh, to a certain extent, there has been uh, a creative freedom for the producers because they're all from, they're all some of the leading names of the Pakistani music industry. We've also had people from India come to Pakistan to perform on the show. So it's, it's been very, it's been sort of a prestigious platform uh, in, in that sense. But uh, to a certain extent, yes, Coke has been uh, uh, sort of pushing for a certain idea of what the Pakistani identity is, what Pakistani music means. And that's heavily problematic. It works. It certainly works in the favor of Coca-Cola, but it doesn't in everyone else's. So yeah. Really